I think historically there'd been this doubt that Canada is a small market uh, and therefore let's really kind of focus on the B2B space and international expansion. And I think we've started to demonstrate over the last few years that building really big consumer companies at scale is actually really possible in Canada. Look to companies like Wealthsimple, Mixware, Sheertex, Neo, you know, the Coho, you know, there's a bunch. And um, that's something that I get really, really excited about. Hi, I'm Tim Penke, founder and CEO of TheFutureEconomy.ca, Canada's platform for discourse on our future economy and all the sectors shaping it, where we speak with the country's foremost leaders in business, policy, academia, finance, and so much more to get their vision about our future economy, but most importantly, what we need to do now. Uh, to get there. What's the next big B2C business in Canada? Our guest today says that the healthcare space is one that's ripe with opportunity. And he founded a company that's revolutionizing a key health service, namely prescriptions. Entrepreneurs really have to have skills, willpower, and a lot of support uh, to break through. And it, that's not just in the healthcare space. It's not easy uh, being an entrepreneur in any industry. Entrepreneurship is a lonely journey. It's filled with roadblocks that look absolutely unpassable. So what does a seasoned entrepreneur like today's guest do to over overcome these challenges? Uh, that's what I asked him about. That's what we spoke about. Here he is to break it down for us. Well, Carl, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. It's really a pleasure to have you. Let's start off with a, a bit about yourself. What's your backstory and what does Felix Health do? What's that company all about? My backstory is, I guess, serial entrepreneurial, if that's a term. <laughs> um, it is now. Uh, it is now, exactly. So I've been an entrepreneur as long as I can remember. My mom would probably tell you that I was uh, an entrepreneur even when I was a small child. Felix represents the third uh, startup venture that I've been lucky to you know, be a part of. 2018, I started to work on the concept that ultimately became Felix. Felix has been, you know, a real innovator uh, in the space of healthcare in Canada, in that we were really a first mover in bringing, you know, this concept of virtual or online healthcare to life, uh, to the masses. So, you know, the category that we always believe internally that we're defining, we call on-demand treatment for everyday health. And really what that means is that we are kind of one part online doctor and, and one part online pharmacy in that we help people get the care that they're looking for from the comfort of their home or from their phone by enabling online connection with doctors, uh, for the purposes of getting a diagnosis and a prescription, you know, to treat a problem. Uh, that you may be facing. And then we ultimately also deliver uh, that medication directly to your door to make the experience extremely seamless. So we always kind of describe that as this end-to-end -end or, or fully integrated healthcare experience where we are, you know, the doctor, the prescriber, uh, the pharmacy delivery, the ongoing care, the renewals, all of those things, you know, baked into one seamless user experience. Awesome. Well, I want to speak a bit about the journey, uh, both your personal journey, but Felix's journey as well. When you look at uh, your, your journey through entrepreneurship and through growing Felix, what have been the most uh, significant challenges or gaps that you've faced and that you think most entrepreneurs uh, in Canada face, be they gaps in, in capital or mentorship or finding the right talent? Uh, what have you seen out there? And what are your ideas on how those problems can be resolved so that, well, Canada can, can be the best place to start, scale, and, and, and expand a business? I think what drives most entrepreneurs is probably curiosity. I think most entrepreneurs just kind of have this perpetual curiosity that is constantly driving them and fueling them. But I think that's definitely, you know, a big attribute. That, that's very common, at least it has been in my experience. But I think on the back of that, as you as you talk about common challenges or gaps, you know, <laughs> there's a lot. Uh, being an entrepreneur is I extremely challenging. You know, I, I feel like I could probably read off a list of, you know, 100, uh, you know, different challenges that you might experience at, you know, different times uh, along the process or along the journey. But I think if I was to highlight a few, I'd probably start with uh, kind of, I guess, loneliness, you know, would be one lack of support, loneliness. Yeah, being an entrepreneur can be a very, very lonely journey at times, um, you know, where you very much feel like 
you're on an island. I think tennis, you know, would be a phenomenal sports metaphor uh, to give here where, you know, you can just feel totally isolated, uh, alone with your own thoughts. I think that really demonstrates the importance of focusing on establishing, you know, really strong networks, you know, trying to create networks of folks that um, you know, you can go to and you can talk to and you can get help from. I think it also talks, you know, a little bit to the importance of mentorship, you know, which can be challenging to find good mentorship, but it's something that you should always be thinking about and, you know, trying to procure to the best of your ability. Um, and I think that, you know, maybe the other piece to that loneliness one would be co-founders. Um, I've never, you know, been involved in a business where I didn't have at least one co-founder, but I always have found it to be unbelievably helpful. So I would always encourage, you know, entrepreneurs to think about, uh, finding co-founders that one really provide a complementary skill set. I think you got to be very careful. You know, when you select a co-founder, you need to make sure they complement your skill set well. You need to make sure that you're really aligned on the work that's going to be involved, how long it might take, and you know all those things. Um, but I think building that type of a support network is really, really, really important. And I would say the last thing there would just be don't be afraid to call people. <laughs> um, you know, don't be afraid to just reach out to people randomly or, or cold call people and ask them for help or, you know, try to establish, you know, a relationship or have a conversation. And you'd be surprised to see how often those can lead to, you know, developing strong people in your network or even developing mentorship. I think there's like a, a lack of confidence. Maybe this relates a bit to the loneliness side, but oftentimes you might figure out very quickly that the business isn't actually working the way that you thought it was <laughs> in that, uh, you know, things aren't necessarily going to plan. And, and that can really create a lot of doubt. Uh, a lot of lonely moments and in, in, in some cases, a lack of confidence. And my advice here is always the same. It's really try to obsess over the customer first and foremost in the problem you're solving, but to try to narrow your market. It's better to find product market fit and demonstrate like proof of concept in like an expandable but narrow niche, in my opinion, uh, than it is to try to kind of do too much at once and then ultimately consistently running into resistance or, or failure. I would say the last note that I have on this one would be... Um, Domain knowledge. Speaking from personal experience, I mean, I've now been a part of three uh, startups, uh, all of which are in totally different industries and subject matters. And you don't always have to be an expert in the subject matter to start a business in a space. But sometimes it's helpful, right? If you do have real domain expertise and you're extremely passionate about a particular topic or subject, it can be very helpful to kind of start a business in that realm and therefore you know, leverage that domain expertise. But in cases where, you know, you don't have that domain expertise, whether it might be in, you know, I, you might have product expertise, but no marketing expertise. And now you're trying to figure out how do I bring the product I built, you know, to market and I don't really understand marketing. Those can be challenging moments for sure. Um, and again, here, I would say, you know, this is where you really want to be able to surround yourself with really smart folks, you know, whether that's in network or they're actually advisors to your business. And there's ways to get people, you know, incentivized to be an advisor in your business. It's another good reason also to work with freelancers or, you know, contractors instead of full-time people to try to kind of supplement, you know, those areas of weakness with, with more expertise. Um, and I would say lastly, that that's also where the complimentary co-founder or co-founders can, can be really helpful. I want to zero in then on, on your space in particular, which is health tech. Uh, so if you look at entrepreneurship within that space, how good do you think we'd say, would you say we are at supporting uh, growing companies within the health tech uh, space and the innovators that are driving them forward? And where are we falling short, uh, if anywhere? Capital always seems to, f to follow, um, you know, innovative companies. And, you know, I think that as long as we have people that are innovating, you know, working hard to to demonstrate concepts that seem valuable and are working well, there's always going to be capital available to those types of businesses. From my perspective, I've seen, you know, a tremendous amount of support, you know, on the software digital side. And there's so many companies that I know well, you know, that are in the health tech space, um, you know, that have been really, really well supported, you know, within the Canadian infrastructure. There's also a responsibility, I think, on the entrepreneur to really kind of like do the work to, to kind of figure out where these opportunities are. You know, there's a lot of programs uh, that you can kind of get into and, and figure out how to kind of get capital and get support in a scrappy way, but they're not necessarily just hanging off trees, right? So the, the entrepreneur or the business still needs to kind of like do the work, you know, to figure out what those are. But but, but my experience is that, 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 that they exist, they're plentiful, and that, you know, the government is doing a great job there. Um, I would say the area of improvement that I always encourage would be more on the education side. As I said earlier, I feel like capital and support will always follow innovation. So people that are 
coming up with great concepts, starting you know interesting businesses, it, you have that kind of entrepreneurial, relentless spirit. You know, capital and support will always find those businesses. And so, for me, the area that we can improve the most would be to try to kind of seed the entrepreneurial spirit earlier in people. And I think that can be done, you know, at the educational level, high school, university. These are areas where we should be really teaching and encouraging entrepreneurship as much as we can. I want to know your your views, your perspective on the funding ecosystem. Uh, for entrepreneurship in Canada, and whether you have any ideas on how it could be uh, improved uh, to to really best support our SMEs. You know, I've talked a lot about funding, and I think that's partly because you know Felix is is a funded business. But there's there's very clearly two tracks in entrepreneurship, and funding doesn't always have to be one of them, right? You know, advice that if I was asked, I, I would give people that are starting businesses is kind of try to figure out pretty early, like, are you building the kind of business that actually requires funding for that vision to come to life? Or do you have an opportunity to build a business that actually maybe doesn't require funding, or at least maybe doesn't require a lot of funding or doesn't require a lot of funding up front? So I always think it's really important to be really purposeful about that. Uh, funding isn't always the answer. Uh, in fact, there's a, there's a number of amazing companies that have been able to bootstrap and, and grow without funding. And <laughs> I've done that in a previous company. In fact, my previous company, we didn't take any institutional funding. So I've kind of seen both sides of it. Uh, and there's and there's absolutely pros and cons to both, but both are very viable paths. In the funding environment in Canada, I would say it's definitely favored B two B businesses um, historically, and B two C, you know, direct to consumer B two C companies like I guess what we would kind of consider Felix. Uh, I would say have maybe been a bit a bit less successful on the funding side, but I think that's starting to change, which is something that I would say is you know we should all be excited about. I think historically there'd been this doubt that Canada is a small market uh, and therefore let's really kind of focus on the B2B space and international expansion. And I think we've started to demonstrate over the last few years that building really big consumer companies at scale is actually really possible in Canada. Of course, I would say Felix is an example of that, um, but you can also look to companies like Wealthsimple, Nixware, Sheertex, Neo, you know, the uh, Coho. You know, there's a bunch. That's something that I get really, really excited about. And I think we should continue to, um, you know, invest more in. You recently, or I should say Felix Health recently uh, took on investment from CBGF, the Canadian Business Growth Fund. Um, I'd like to ask why, why you chose to accept that investment and uh, what are the plans for it? What is it going to allow Felix to do? Me and my co-founder's philosophy on on fundraising and choosing investment partners has has always been fairly simple and it's definitely been consistent, which is to always choose people over terms. You know, wanting to choose investors that we felt like we really enjoyed working with and, and would continue to enjoy working with. Investors and companies are a marriage. And when you decide to, you know, involve investors in your business, these are folks that are not only there to support the company, but are also, you know, folks that you're going to be working with for an extremely long period of time. So it's always important, in my opinion, to put people over terms. That being said, we love the people at CBGF. Um, we really enjoyed getting to know them. They really understand the Canadian market, which was important to us because obviously healthcare in Canada is very unique. So having investors that, you know, just kind of intuitively understand the Canadian market and, and what healthcare means to Canada, we've always thought was really important. And we also really respected and liked the fact that you know, CBGF brought a very, uh, I guess I would call like a responsible operating mentality uh, to their businesses, um, not just a, you know, growth at all costs mentality, you know, which, you know, other types of investors can, can have sometimes. And not to say that one is necessarily better than the other, but from our perspective, we've always been very interested in, you know, wanting to operate an efficient business and a responsible business, not just, you know, grow no matter what. I wanted to know uh, what your advice would be to young Canadian entrepreneurs who are looking to launch or scale their company. Um, any tips on on immediate priorities when you've got a good idea and you, you want to go after it? I'm always a big proponent too of you know trying to validate your idea as quickly as possible. I've often found that sometimes you know entrepreneurs can spend way too long trying to perfect a product or a service before they ultimately bring it to market and get real world feedback. So I'm very much a proponent of trying to get something in market as quickly as possible and then actually learn from real users and iterate from there. That's not always possible for, depending on the company. Felix is actually a really good example of that. It was very, very difficult for Felix to come to market with like a super lean 
um, version of the product because it was very complicated and we're handling people's healthcare and we're doing prescriptions online. So, you know, we did really try to get to market as quickly as we can. And as I said, we weren't like overly proud of the first version of our product, which is I think the way that it should be. You know, I guess these are more like, you know, values, uh, you know, or attributes to live by, but curiosity, be curious, um, find a way. Funny enough, these are actually two core values at Felix, which is be curious and find a way. <laughs> um, so these are two core values of our company, but I think that they're really, really critical um, when you're working on innovative concepts. Be prepared to go all in. I think that you have to really ask yourself honestly, am I prepared to drop everything and go all into this? If you're not, if there's something kind of nagging you, don't do it because you can't really jump in and start a, a company unless you're really willing to dedicate your your entire you know being to it. At least that's my perspective. So that would be on the launch side. I think the scale side, it's a little bit different. Focus on establishing good economic fundamentals as early as possible. And don't push off monetization as something I'll figure out later. I think these days of we're acquiring a lot of customers, but we're losing a lot of money and we don't really know how to make money. I think those days are behind us, um, at least for now. I've never really been a huge proponent of that. So I, I would say really kind of focus on, you know, those fundamentals and, and and make sure that you've got a revenue model that makes a lot of sense. And that's kind of like an efficiency thing, right? Efficient growth, not growth at all costs. And then the last thing I think would just be patience. I think over the last several years, we've been a little bit impatient in the way that we've kind of expected, you know, unicorns to be built in two years or a year and a half or three years. And I think the reality is that great businesses aren't built overnight. They take time. So don't be afraid to be patient. Kyle, that's a, that's a lot of great advice. Thank you so much for, for dropping that on us. Um, I, I hope a lot of young Canadians are listening and can get uh, a good bunch of nuggets out of that. I want to give you the same opportunity to give a few other groups in Canada some advice. You're part of the health and life sciences uh, industry. Do you have a call to action for the wider industry in terms of how uh, growing companies like like yourselves and, uh, and Felix should be supported? Yeah, I think it would be to continue to be open to change. <laughs> that's that's a bold one. That's a bold one. I like it. I, I think that it's really, really important because I think that when when you're talking about innovating in any space, you know, particularly, you know, whether it's fintech or health tech, you know, these are spaces that, you know, they're regulated spaces that, you know, dominated by incumbents and and that's all great. Um, but I also think that we always want to push ourselves to be open to how things can be better. So there's an air of curiosity there, as you know, I've said that word probably multiple times now throughout. But, you know, I think if we're all just curious and we're all curious to try to see how things can be better and things can improve, then we're all going to be in a great spot. So my encouragement would always just be to, you know, stay open minded, continue to be open minded, continue to be curious and think about, you know, how new ideas and concepts um, can be positive. Um, and, and make change in a way that's very beneficial. Great. And the last one I have is investors or funds uh, like CBGF. Keep doing what you're doing. I mean, you know, so many companies just don't. Investors like CBGF and, you know, institutional investors of all kinds are, are really sometimes the fuel that, you know, um, makes these companies uh, grow and scale. These companies that we talked about in the interview that have become part of our lives that we rely on every day. Uh, many of which wouldn't uh, have been possible without investors. So um, obviously, investors play a critical role um, in our in our in our innovation economy. And I would just say, keep doing what you're doing. Keep finding awesome and interesting companies, um, and you know, keep supporting them as much as you can. Thanks so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the conversation with Kyle. Uh, I found it very insightful to see how he's shaped his approach to entrepreneurship. I also really appreciated his advice to entrepreneurs to really go out there and fight for support and opportunities. And that's something that definitely resonated with me. Uh, but what about you? Which of his calls to action really uh, connected with you the most? Let us know down in the comments down below. And if you want to stay up to date on everything shaping Canada's future economy and the key sectors within it, subscribe to this channel for more interviews with Canadian leaders and experts. Also, if you want some exclusive content that you're not going to find anywhere else, such as in-depth Q&As with our guests to really find out more about who they are and what makes them tick, you got to sign up for our newsletter. The link for that's in the description below. So go ahead and sign up and you'll get all that and much, much more. Thanks for watching. See you next time.